morning, Cornerstone. Each time someone comes up here and says good morning, more and more people have chimed in, so I really appreciate that. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Shane Murphy. I am the youth pastor here at Cornerstone, uh, and today I have the privilege of bringing you guys the word. Uh, we have started a series in Isaiah, and so we had looked a little bit about the context of Isaiah, about the book, uh, about who Isaiah is. And now we're actually pretty much skipping ahead near to the second half of the book. Isaiah is a very long book. Uh, and we're going to be looking at Isaiah 40, chapter 40, verses 1 through 20, about the comforting God. And so I would really encourage you, if you have your Bible with you, or if you have a phone with a Bible app, take it out, start looking it up, start getting there now. I'll give you a little bit of time because I really struggled with PowerPoint trying to format this and it took me so long that I actually gave up and just typed it out all by hand. Um, by hand, I guess that's a misnomer. But really encourage you to read along with me because this is a, it's a sizable passage. We're gonna read it together and then we'll break it down into smaller pieces and then we'll look at how it all ties together in the end. So Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 20. While you're still looking up how to get there, a little bit of context is verse or chapter 39 ends actually with a story about one of the kings of Judah, the, uh, the country of Judah. His name was Hezekiah. And it's a narrative telling, almost like you're reading, a, it was like a story of it. And it was talking about Hezekiah and how essentially Isaiah was saying, the, the problems that you have caused won't land on you, but they will land on your children, right? And so that was the end of chapter 39. And then chapter 40 actually picks up nearly 150 years later. Because he's no longer talking about the doom, the gloom, the, the woe to you, Israel and Judah. You have done wrong and you will have repercussions. He's no longer talking about that. It's 150 years later when they're in exile. And he's speaking to them about they've already gone through this doom. They've already gone through the issues that Isaiah prophesied about. And now he's talking to the hope, the comfort, the future with them. So we're going to read it all together and then... We will break it down from there. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass. And all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. And he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on a scales, and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. 
They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering, well, they select wood that will not rot, and they look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. This is the word of God. So as you can, well, as you know, this is a fairly lengthy passage. And so we are going to break it up into smaller chunks and then see how it all ties in together. But one thing I really encourage you is I'm going to read each chunk again because a good thing, well, in Psalms it says that we should meditate on the word of the Lord. And so something that I really want to encourage you is listen to what God is saying in here as well. So we're looking at the first two verses together, and this is the comforter. He says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Now, the people of Israel, they're not back in Jerusalem yet. The people of Jerusalem, they haven't been, like, they haven't really received what would they say going back to normal, right? They haven't received the normal that all of us kind of want after something bad happens to us or after some life-changing event happens. We're always like, oh, we just wish we could go back to normal. They haven't received that. They're still in exile. They're still taken from their homes by force and forced to live in a different land. And yet God is saying to them, comfort. Comfort in the middle of their chaos. They're still stuck in that cycle of sinning of turning against God and the consequences. And yet God says, don't give up. I am still faithful. Comfort my people. And as we will see in the, the next uh, passages, is that God's comfort is connected to his glory, to his holiness. It's not necessarily a soft comfort. It's not necessarily a, a, oh, you poor little baby, I'm so sorry. But it says, look at my glory, look at my goodness, and know that I am good. Then we look at verses 3 through to 5, the future glory. Now, some of you guys might have uh, thought that this sounded a little familiar. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. So we actually see this here in Isaiah, and it's actually referred to in the New Testament as the divine inspiration for a guy that we probably all know, John the Baptist. In Matthew 3, verse 3, it says, this is the quote, it says, This is the one, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, it's kind of interesting because the punctuation is a little bit different uh, because, well, back in the day when you were writing on a piece of parchment, you only had so much space, right? So everything was crammed together. It was harder to tell in what order. And so the punctuation works both ways. But you'll notice in the Isaiah passage, it says, A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. And in fact, some of you guys might know of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, made in Qumran. Some people believe that that was a big inspiration for them to move to the desert, was the, the idea of in the wilderness, go to the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord. But the New Testament writers, they looked at John and they saw it in the light of what Jesus was doing. And they say, oh, the voice of one who is calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. And they saw that as pointing directly to John. And now, the rest of it as well, with every valley being raised up, it also points to his coming glory in Jesus. In that all the obstacles towards seeing God, all the obstacles to seeing his glory, are made flat, are made so that you, the whole world could see his glory and is revealed to us in Jesus, which I'll touch on in a bit. Next, we can look at verses 6 to 11. The voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. 
I think that's a kind of a, a cool image because I think of like the Microsoft background screensaver of that grassy field and I'm like, oh, that's kind of nice. And like flowers, they're beautiful, right? I mean, there's probably a few gardeners in this room. Like, we love flowers. Flowers are great. And it says their faithfulness is like the flowers. Like, sometimes it is kind of pretty. It is kind of beautiful. And yet the grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Their faithfulness, their kingdoms, whatever they have built up for themselves, it withers. It fails. But the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. While we are like grass, while our faithfulness, our, our works, whatever we do, it withers, it fades with time. The word of the Lord endures forever. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. He was the God of our grandparents, our parents, us, our kids, our grandkids, whether they like it or not. He is the God of all generations. He is eternal, and we are not. And yet, this eternal God, this God who to him our lives must be like a flash in the bucket. Or flash in the pan, sorry, not in the bucket. Uh, to him, with our lives being so quick, he still takes care of his flock. He says in verse 11, he says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. A people that are so quickly gone, but yet he cares for each and every one of them like a shepherd does for his sheep. And in fact, Jesus would even take up that mantle when he says, I am the good shepherd. Right? He's reminding people that I am the one who takes care of you. Now, if we look at uh, verses 12 through 17... Uh, I think that, Josue, either you must have read today's passage beforehand, but all the songs you were singing, I think, really reflect the greatness of God. And it sounds very similar to what we hear, see here. And sometimes when I read these, when it says, who has measured, sometimes I need to almost replace it with, have you. As if the, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to me. Right? Have you measured the waters in the hollow of your hand? Right? And so I'm going to read this again, and I just want us to focus on the greatness of God here. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge? Or showed him the path of understanding? Now, these verses were probably a little important to the people reading it. Because if you think about it, these people, they worshipped God. Well, they worshipped other gods at the same time. That was the whole point. Uh, is that they were having an issue with, we, we trying to follow God, but we're not doing well. And God let us be captured, destroyed, put into exile. Is God really that powerful if he let us be defeated? Is God really in control if he let us go into the hands of our enemies? What's going on? Right? I'm sure that we have all had questions like that. When we are in a hard situation, we're like, God, Why? Why are you letting us go through this? Are you not good? Are you not able to stop it? And this is a reminder. He's saying, who are you? Have you instructed God of his greatness? Have you instructed God in what is right? Did you tell God how to lay the foundations of the earth? Did you give counsel to him? Are you his advisor? Are you worthy of stepping into his throne? Are you worthy of stepping into his seat and taking control and organizing everything? It shows that God is still in control. God is still on his throne. And in fact, the reminder is as well is that God is so powerful and so great, and yet he still is faithful to his people. 
Because we see, when we look back on the faithfulness withering like flowers, it's true. The people of Israel, they were not faithful. That's actually, God says that's why they're in that predicament. Verses, well, chapter 1 through 39, the whole first half is, hey, stop it. Turn back to God because you are running away from him. And if you continue this, bad things will happen. And they continued. And so now bad things have happened. And God had really every right to say, you know what? You guys have done nothing. You haven't, you haven't kept your word. You have betrayed me at every step. You have turned your back on me. Why should I help you? I'm the one in control. I'm the one who's all powerful, not you. And yet you keep acting like it. And yet God is still faithful to his people. Even in the midst of all this. And we see in 13, no 13, sorry, 15 to 17, it says, surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as if though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for the altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Uh, for those of you who are thinking, well, Lebanon, because we think of kind of the Middle East, we're like, isn't, sometimes our stereotype is like barren land, right? But Back in the day, that was like where they got their forests from. That was where they bought, built their ships from the wood from Lebanon. That was the big idea. So if you think about it, think about Canada. Maybe that's another way to say it that's more close to home. The woods in Canada, although we do set them on fire every summer apparently, the woods in Canada are not enough. You could set all of Canada on fire and it wouldn't be enough to light the altar fire for God. Right? There's no nation in the world that is sufficient for God. And it says, Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Now, remember the context here. They have just been brutally conquered, well, attacked by the Assyrians, the Israelite, the northern kingdom was taken by the Assyrians. You have the Egyptians marching through. You have the Babylonians taking over. It seems kind of like the nations are a big deal for Israel to deal with right now. Right? They have been conquered. They have been whacked around. They have been thrown into exile. And yet God says they are like nothing to him. See, the nations aren't a threat to God. Well, it might look like, oh my goodness, like God, we are losing. God, God says, do you think that Assyria is really going to dethrone me? Do you think the Babylonians are going to take God and put him on his knees and bring him back into their home country and put him on parade. God says, these aren't a threat to me. I am still in control. I am using them. And then once they are done, they will fade like the flowers in the field. They aren't so big, so scary that God is trembling before them. God says, in fact, they are actually being used by me. They are part of my plan. I am still in control. And the last part we look at is God having no equal. In verses 18 to 20, With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering, they select wood that will not rot, they looked for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Now, there are still cultures that will make little idols and put them in, in their house, but they're not as common here in North America where we are. But we shouldn't be deceived and look at this and say, yeah, well, you know, I don't have a big gold statue in my backyard, so I'm good. We make plenty of idols. We do it all the time. It's what we do as people. We take things and we say, this is greater than God. This is what will save me. Maybe for some of us, it is wealth. Maybe we're like, if I just earn enough money, if I get a job that pays enough per hour, if I start my own business, then maybe I'll be able to be saved. But what, what cost is your salvation? How much will you give to God to pay for your salvation? Is there enough money in the world? Can you burn all of Canada in order to do that? Right? Maybe it's in relationships. Maybe you're thinking, oh, if only I have the proper relationship with my spouse or my partner. Maybe it's if I know the right people. Maybe if I'm the right person to know. What is your idol? Where do you run? To whom do you compare God? Because we all do it. We all compare God to someone. 
Now, to tie it all together, and I know that this is a large passage, but it all actually does come together. And I have a really good, good way to sum it all up for you guys, so when you leave here, you can say, okay, just remember this part, that's all you need, all right? But we'll get there in a second. So, the comfort is always connected to God's glory. The Israelites were obviously going through a lot of problems. They were going through a lot of distress. Their people were scattered. They're living in a strange land. They were oppressed. They were beaten. They were broken. So when God says to comfort them, it's not just a sympathy of, oh, I'm really sorry that it happened to you. God points to his glory and says, this is the God that you worship. So when I say comfort, know that I am in control. That I am working all things for my good. In your own situations in life, sometimes things are pretty big. I'm not going to lie. There are times where we might feel like the Israelites and say, God, how, how did you let this happen? How can you still be good? And God says, I am still on my throne and I am still faithful to you. Whatever you are going through, I am still faithful to my people. The future comfort and glory is also in Jesus. We have a great benefit today uh, that we get to look back and we get to see Jesus and we get to see what he has done and how he has changed our lives and how he has shown God's glory. But for them back then, they didn't have that yet. And so God was still the one who you had to go to the temple. He was too holy to be in your presence. We had actually a, an intergenerational night uh, last Friday with uh, all the youth and a bunch of adults. And one of the parts that we did was we shared a testimony. Um, and one of the testimonies shared, I'm just going to throw Jorge under the bus here, was that when he was learning about, uh, learning about God, learning about Christianity and Jesus, is he said that there were so many pastors that were too holy. They were too holy for him to understand. To, they were too holy to connect with. Because they wouldn't associate with someone like him. Or they would say things that you're like, I don't understand that. I don't speak, like, I don't speak that language. I don't understand that language. It's too lofty. It's too holy for me. How am I supposed to understand that? And in a way, the Israelites also kind of had that, right? Where it's like, God is so holy and he reveals himself in the prophets. But how can you truly understand and fathom God, right? He's even expressing it here. He says, can you understand me? Do you understand my ways? And yet, in Jorge's story, he said one essentially almost dropped into his life. One almost came into his life that was down to earth. That was able to reveal Jesus in a way that Jorge was able to understand. And in a way, that's what Jesus did. Right? When he's talking here, the divine inspiration for John the Baptist make straight the paths of the Lord and that the world, everyone will see and his glory will be revealed to everyone. And that's what Jesus did for us. He came and dropped into our lives, essentially. He came to us to show us and reveal to us who God is, the love of the Father, the glory of God in a way that we can understand and in a way that bridges that connection that gives us a way to approach God, to be with Him. And the last part is the question of who will you run to? What idol can we build that will replace God? We know there are none. But what statues do we build by our hand that we hope will save us? Or what skill or resources do we have that we place our faith in, that we place our trust in? And yet God always reminds us, remember his glory, remember his goodness, for none can compare to him. God is bigger than we can imagine. He's in control of everything. He's in control of things that even when it doesn't seem like that to us. And even in that, he loves his people. He carries them close to his heart like a shepherd does a little lamb. I think a really good way to sum this up is actually found in the New Testament. 
It's in a line by Simon Peter, the Apostle Peter. And it's in John chapter 6, verse 68, 69. And it says this. And I think it sums up this entire portion really well. If you walk away and you're like, I only remember one part, just remember this. Simon Peter answered Jesus, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Lord, to whom shall we go? Whom shall we compare you to? Who is wiser than you? Who is better than you? You have the words of eternal life. The word of the Lord endures forever. Okay? And we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. The Holy One of Israel is the title that Isaiah often gives God. So if you were to remember anything from this, remember that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that, uh, well, you are so far above us. You are so far beyond us, Lord, that you came to us, that you revealed yourself to us in your son, Jesus, that you have shown us your glory. Lord, I thank you that uh, you are for us that you are faithful to your people even when we aren't faithful to you, even when we make mistakes, and sometimes they aren't mistakes, sometimes they're on purpose. You are still faithful to us. We do not deserve that. But Lord, we also can take great comfort in the fact that you are still on your throne, that you are good, that you love us, and that you have made a way for us to be with you. Lord, when we feel like the Israelites, when we feel like uh, the tribe of Judah, that we are in exile, that it is darkness all around us, that we don't know how you can be good, we look to the prophet Isaiah, we look at his words, and we see uh, his reminder to stay faithful to you, to stay uh, fixed upon you and your goodness. So I thank you for all these things in your name. Amen.